Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, by Robert C. O'Brien, Day One. The Sickness of Timothy Frisbee. Mrs. Frisbee, the head of a family of field mice, lived in an underground house in the vegetable garden of a farmer named Mr. Fitzgibbon. It was a winter house, such as some field mice move to when food becomes too scarce and the living too hard in the woods and pastures. In the soft earth of a bean, potato, black-eyed pea, and asparagus patch, there is plenty of food left over for mice after the human crop has been gathered. Mrs. Frisbee and her family were especially lucky in the house itself. It was a slightly damaged cinder block, the hollow kind, with two oval holes through it. It had somehow been abandoned in the garden during the summer and lay almost completely buried, with only a bit of one corner showing above ground, which is how Mrs. Frisbee had discovered it. It lay on its side in such a way that the solid parts of the block formed a roof and a floor, both waterproof, and the hollows made two spacious rooms, lined with bits of leaves, grass, cloth, cotton fluff, feathers, and other soft things Mrs. Frisbee and her children had collected. The house stayed dry, warm and comfortable all winter. A tunnel to the surface earth of the garden, dug so that it was slightly larger than a mouse and slightly smaller than a cat's foreleg, provided access, air, and even a fair amount of light to the living room. The bedroom, formed by the second oval, was warm but dark, even at midday. A short tunnel through the earth behind the block connected the two rooms. Although she was a widow, her husband had died only the preceding summer. Mrs. Frisbee was able, through luck and hard work, to keep her family. There were four children, happy and well-fed. January and February were the hardest months. The sharp, hard cold that began in December lasted until March, and by February, the beans and black eyes had picked over with help from the birds. The asparagus roots were frozen into stone, and the potatoes had been thawed and refrozen so many times they had acquired a slimy texture and a rancid taste. Still, the Frisbees made the best of what there was, and one way or another, they kept from being hungry. Then one day, at the very end of February, Mrs. Frisbee's younger son, Timothy, fell sick. That day began with a dry, bright, icy morning. Mrs. Frisbee woke up early, as she always did. She and her family slept close together in a bed of down, fluff, and bits of cloth they had gathered, warm as a ball of fur. She stood up carefully so as not to waken the children and walked quietly through the short tunnel to the living room. Here it was not so warm, but not really cold either. She could see from the light filtering down the entrance tunnel that the sun was up and bright. She looked at the food in her pantry, a hollowed out space lined with small stones in the earth behind the living room. There was plenty of food for breakfast and lunch and dinner too, for that matter. But still the sight depressed her, for it was the same tiresome fare they had been eating every day, every meal for the last month. She wished she knew where to find a bit of green lettuce, or a small egg, or a taste of cheese, or a corn muffin. There were eggs in plenty not far off in the hen house, but the hens and hens' eggs are too big for a field mouse to cope with. And besides, between the garden and the hen house, there was a wide sward of shrubs and grass, some of it grown up quite tall, cat territory. She climbed up the tunnel, emerging whiskers first, and looked around warily. The air was sharp, and there was white frost thick on the ground on the dead leaves at the edge of the wood across the garden patch. Mrs. Frisbee set off over the gently furrowed earth, and when she reached the fence, she turned right, skirting the border of the forest, searching with her bright round eyes for a bit of carrot, a frozen parsnip, or something green. But there was nothing green at that time of year but the needles on the pine trees and the leaves on the holly, neither of which a mouse, or any other animal, for that matter, can eat. And then straight in front of her, she did see something green. She had reached the far corner of the garden, and there at the edge of the woods where it met the fence was a stump. In the stump there was a hole, and out of the hole protruded something that looked a little like a leaf, but was not. Mrs. Frisbee had no trouble at all going through the cattle wire fence, but she approached the hole cautiously. If the stump was hollow, as it seemed to be, there was no telling who or what might be living in it. A foot or so from the hole she stopped, stood still, and watched, and listened. She could hear no sound, but from there she could see what the green was. It was, in fact, a yellowish-brownish green, a bit of a corn shuck. But what was a corn shuck doing there? The cornfield was in a different part of the farm altogether, away beyond the pasture. Mrs. Frisbee hopped closer, and then, carefully, crept up the side of the stump and peered inside. <clears throat> when, her eye, when her eyes got used to the dark, she saw that she had found a treasure, a winter supply of food, carefully stored and then, for some reason, forgotten or abandoned. But stored by whom? A raccoon, perhaps? Not very likely, so far from the stream. More likely a squirrel or a groundhog. She knew that both of these felt free 
to help themselves to the new corn each year, and that they were strong enough to carry ears away and store them. But whoever had done it, why had they then abandoned the store? And then she remembered. Back in November there had come from near that edge of the woods the sound that sends all the animals in the forest shivering to their hiding places, the sound of hunters' guns shooting, the sound that is accompanied for someone by a fiery stabbing pain, and then he never needs his stored food again. Still, since Mrs. Frisbee did not even know what kind of animal it had been, much less his name, she could not shed many tears over him, and food was food. It was not the green lettuce she had longed for, but she and her children were extremely fond of corn, and there were eight large ears in the stump, a noble supply for a mouse family. Down under the corn, she could also see a pile of fresh peanuts from still another part of the farm, some hickory nuts, and a stack of dried, sweet-smelling mushrooms. With her forepaws and sharp teeth, she pulled off a part of the husk from the top ear of corn and folded it in double to serve as a crude carrying bag. Then she pulled loose as many of the yellow kernels as she could easily lift and put them in the shuck bag. She hopped off briskly for home. She would come back for more after breakfast and bring the children to help. She backed down the tunnel entrance to her house tail first, pulling the corn after her and calling cheerfully as she went. Children, wake up. See what I have for breakfast. A surprise. <clears throat> they came hurrying out, rubbing their eyes in excitement for any kind of surprise and food was a rare and festive thing in the cold dead of winter. Teresa, the oldest, came first, crowding close behind her was Martin, the biggest, a strong, quick mouse, dark-haired and handsome like his poor father. Then came Cynthia, the youngest, a slim, pretty little girl mouse, light-haired and, in fact, a little light-headed as well, and overfound fond of dancing. Where is it, she said. What is it? What? Where is the surprise? Where is Timothy? asked Mrs. Frisbee. Mother, said Teresa, concerned. He says he's sick and can't get up. Nonsense. Martin, tell your brother to get out of bed at once or he'll get no breakfast. Martin ran to the bedroom immediately but came back in a moment alone. He says he feels too sick and he doesn't want any breakfast, even a surprise. I felt his forehead, and it's burning hot. Oh, dear, said Mrs. Frisbee. That sounds as if he really, really is sick. Timothy had, on occasion, been known to think he was sick when he really was not. Here, you may all have your breakfast. Save Timothy's, and I'll go and see what's wrong. She opened up the green carrying bag and put the corn on the table, dividing it into five equal shares. The dining table was a smooth piece of wath, supported on both ends by stones. Corn, shouted Martin. Oh, mother, where did you ever get it? Eat up, said Mrs. Frisbee, and a little later I'll show you because there's a lot more where this came from. And she disappeared into the little hallway that led to the bedroom. A lot more, Martin repeated as he sat down with his two sisters. That sounds like enough to last till moving day. I hope so, Cynthia said. When is moving day, anyway? Two weeks, said Martin authoritatively. Maybe three. Oh, Martin, how do you know, protested Teresa. What if it stays cold? Anyway, suppose Timothy isn't well enough. At this dreadful thought, so casually raised, they all grew worried and fell silent. Then Cynthia said, Teresa, you shouldn't be so gloomy. Of course he'll be well. He'll just, he's just got a cold, that's all. She finished eating her corn, and so did the others. In the bedroom, Mrs. Frisbee felt Timothy's forehead. It was indeed hot and damp with sweat. She took his pulse and dropped his wrist in alarm at what she felt. Do you feel sick to your stomach? No, mother. I feel all right, only cold. And when I sit up, I get dizzy, and I can't get my breath too well. Mrs. Frisbee peered anxiously at his face and would have looked at his tongue, but in the dark room she could see, see no more than the dim outline of his head. He was the thinnest, thinnest of her children and had a dark complexion like his father and brother. He was narrow of face. His eyes were unusually large and bright and shone with the intensity of his thought and when he spoke. He was, Mrs. Frisbee knew, the smartest and most thoughtful of her children, though she would never have admitted it this aloud. She was all... But he was also the frailest, and when colds or flus or virus infections came around, he was the first to catch them and the slowest to recover. He was also, perhaps, as a result, something of a hypochondriac. But there was no doubt he was really sick this time. His head felt as if he had a high fever and his pulse was very fast. Poor Timothy, lie back down and keep covered. She spread over him some of the bits of cloth they used as blankets. After a while, we'll fix you a pallet in the living room so you can lie out and lie out where it's light. I found a fine supply of corn this morning, more than we can eat for the rest of the winter. Would you like some? No, thank you. I'm not hungry. Not now. He closed his eyes, and in a few minutes he went to sleep, but it was a restless sleep in which he tossed and moaned continually. In mid-morning, Mrs. Frisbee, Martin, and Cynthia set off for the stump to carry home some more of the corn and some peanuts and mushrooms, the hickory nuts they would leave, for they were too hard for mouse jaws to crack and too tedious to gnaw through.
they left Teresa home to look after Timothy, whom they had wrapped up and held, helped into a temporary sickbed in the living room. When they returned at lunchtime, carrying heavy loads of food, they found her near tears from worry. Timothy was much worse. His eyes looked wild and strained from the fever. He trembled continuously, and each breath he took sounded like a gasp for life. Teresa said, Oh, Mother, I'm so glad you're back. But he's been having nightmares and shouting about monsters and cats, and when I talk to him, he doesn't hear me at all. Not only was Timothy not hearing with his ears, his eyes, though wide open, were not seeing. Or if they were, he was not recognizing what he saw. When his mother tried to talk to him, to hold his hand and ask him how he felt, he stared past her as if she did not exist. Then he gave out a long, low moan and seemed to be trying to say something, but the words would not form properly and made no sense at all. The other children stared in frightened silence. Finally, Martin asked, Mother, what is it? What's wrong with him? Is he terribly ill? His fever is so high he has become delirious. There is nothing for it. I will have to go and see Mr. Ages. Timothy must have medicine. Mr. Ages. Mr. Ages was a white mouse who lived across the farm and beyond, in a house that was part of a brick wall. The wall lined the basement of what had once been a large farmhouse. The farmhouse itself had burned down so many years ago that nobody could remember what it had looked like, nor who had lived there. The basement remained a great square hole in the ground, and in its crumbling walls, protected from the wind and snow, numerous small creatures lived. In summer, there were snakes, dangerous to Mrs. Frisbee, but there was no need to worry about them in the winter. Just the same, it was a long, hard journey, and could be risky unless she was extremely cautious. It was so far, in fact, that Mrs. Frisbee would not ordinarily have set out so late in the day for fear that the dark would catch up, catch her before she got back. But Timothy obviously could not wait until the next day, so only five minutes after she had announced that she must go, she was gone. If she had been able to follow her nose, that is, to take the shortest route to where Mr. Ages lived, her journey would have been easy enough, but since that would have led her close to the farmhouse and the barn, and since the cat stalked those grounds relentlessly, she had to plot a much more roundabout way, circling the whole wide farmyard and sticking to the fringe of the woods. She loped across briskly, moving in the easy horse-like canter mice use when they are trying to cover ground. Her progress was almost completely noiseless. She ch chose her path where the earth was bare or where the grass grew, and she avoided dead leaves, which would rustle and crackle even under her small weight. Always she kept an eye out for, the hi for hiding places, logs, roots, stones, things to scurry under if she would meet a larger animal who might be unfriendly. For though the cat was number one, there were other things in the woods that chased mice. And as she did all this, she worried about Timothy and hoped that Mr. Ages would know something that would help him. It was more than two hours later that she saw she was getting close to the brick wall where he lived. Though her husband had been a great friend of Mr. Ages and had visited him often, Mrs. Frisbee herself had there been there only once before, and that had been in summer. Still, she remembered the place clearly. It was an odd sort of clearing in the woods long ago when the old house had been lived in, before it had burned. There must have been a wide lawn around it. Over the years, this clearing had grown over with a strange mixture of high, rank grass, tall weeds, berries, and wild flowers. In the summer, it was a wild and beautiful place, bright with blooms and full of smell of blackberry blossoms and purple clover. There were harsher plants as well, spiked jimson, jimson weeds and poisonous dark pokeberries and bees droning everywhere. But in the winter, it had a bleak and almost ghostly look. For the blossoms and the green leaves were gone, and only the dry skeletons of the weeds stood, hung with stalks and seeds and pods that rattled in the wind. It was from these seeds and others, and from the flowers and roots beneath them, that Mr. Ages made the draughts and powders that could sometimes save the sick from dying. The time she had been here before, that was for Timothy too, when he was only a baby, scarcely bigger than a marble. He had wandered while playing with other, the other children, a little away from them, and had been bitten or stung by something poisonous. They did not know what. When the others found him, he lay curled in a ball, paralyzed and scarcely able to breathe. That time her husband, Mr. Frisbee, had been alive, and between them, taking turns, they had managed to carry Timothy to Mr. Age's house. It was a sad and frightening journey, and when they arrived, they had been afraid he might already be dead. Mr. Age's looked at him, examined his tongue, felt his pulse, and found a small red lump near his neck. Spider, he said. Not a black widow, but bad enough. He had forced a few drops of milky liquid into Timothy's mouth and held him upright so that it could trickle down his throat, for Timothy could not swallow. In a few minutes, his small muscles had unlocked, and he was able to move his arms and legs. He'll be all right, said Mr. Ages, but weak for a few hours. 
The trip back home had been a happy one, and the other children were wide-eyed with joy to see Timothy alive. Yet Mrs. Frisbee thought that this had been the beginning of his frailness. From that time on, he tended to stumble a little when he walked, especially when he was tired. He never grew as big or as vigorous as his brother Martin, but he thought a great deal more, and in that he resembled his father. Now she had reached Mr. H.'s house, a hole in the brick wall where one end of heavy floor beamed had once rested. It was about two feet below the top of the wall, and one reached it by climbing down a sort of rough stairway of broken brick ends. She knocked on his door and made a piece of shingle, made of a piece of shingle. Oh, let me be, <coughs> let him be in, please, she thought, but he was not. There was no answer, so she sat down to wait on the narrow ledge of brick in front of his door. Half an hour passed, the sun sinking lower in the west all the time, before she heard a slight scratching noise up above, and there he came, carrying a cloth sack bulging with some kind of lumpy material. His fur was a soft gray-white and so glossy he seemed almost to glow. Mr. Mrs. Frisbee had heard that Mr. Ages was not truly a white mouse, that is, he had not been born with white fur, but had turned white from old age. Whether this was so or not, she did not know. Certainly he seemed very old and very wise, yet he walked nimbly enough. Oh, Mr. Ages, I am so glad you've come, she said. I don't suppose you remember me, Mrs. Frisbee. Of course I remember you, and I was sad to hear about your your poor Mr. Frisbee. How is your young son, Timothy, was it? It's about him I've come to see you. He's taken terribly sick. Has he? I was afraid he might turn out to be not as strong as the others. I hope you might be able to help him. That may be. Come in, please, so I can put down the sack. Mr. Ages' house, somewhat larger than a shoebox, but about the same shape, resembled the house of a hermit. It was bare furniture except for a bit of bedding in one corner, a stool made of a piece of brick, and another piece of brick worn smooth from use as a pe <coughs> pestle on which he ground out his medicines. On one entire wall, arranged neatly in small piles, stood the straw, raw materials he had collected, roots, seeds, dried leaves, pods, strips of bark, and shriveled mushrooms. To this row he now added the contents of a sack. It was held it held a number of small plants, all of them the same kind, with stringy roots and dark, veined green leaves that looked like mint. Pipsisua, said Mr. Ages, botanically, <clears throat> Camaphila umbellata. It stays green all winter and makes a very useful spring tonic. Most people use only the leaves, but I have found the roots even more effective. He arranged the plants in an orderly pile, but that's not what you're here for. What's wrong with young Timothy? He has a very high fever. He's delirious. I don't know what to do. How high? So high that he feels burning hot to the touch, runs with perspiration, and yet he shivers with cold at the same time. Keep him wrapped up in a blanket. I do. And his pulse? So fast that you cannot tell one heartbeat from the next. His tongue? So coated that it looks purple. How does he breathe? He breathes very rapidly, and the air rasps in his chest. He said at first that he could not get his breath, but he does not cough? No. He has pneumonia, said Mr. Ages. I have some medicine that will help him, but the most important thing is to keep him warm, and he must stay in bed. He went back to the back of his house, and from a ledge formed of projecting brick, he took three packets of medicine, powders neatly wrapped in white paper. Give him one of these tonight. Mix it in water and make him drink it. If he is still delirious, hold his nose and pour it down his throat. Give him the second one tomorrow morning, and the third the next morning. Mrs. Frisbee took the packages. Will he get better, she asked dreading to hear the answer. He will get better this time. His fever will be less on the second day and gone the third after he's taken all the medicine. That does not mean he will have recovered. His lungs will still be terribly weak and sensitive. If he gets the least bit cold or breath breathes cold air, even a breath or two, the pneumonia will surely come back worse than before and the second time he may not recover. This will be true for at least three weeks and more likely a month. And after that, even after that, he should be careful, though. We may hope by then the weather will be warmer. By now the sun was getting low in the west, settling into the high mountains beyond the woods. Mrs. Risby thanked Mr. Ages and set out for home as quickly as she could go. The Crow and the Hat Mrs. Frisbee looked again at the sun and saw that she faced an unpleasant choice. She could go home by the same roundabout way she had come, in which case she would surely end up walking alone in the woods in the dark, a frightening prospect, for at night the forest was alive with danger. Then the owl came out to hunt, and foxes, weasels, and strange wildcats stalked among the tree trunks. The other choice would be dangerous, too, but with luck, it would get her home before dark. That would be to take a straighter route, across the farmyard, between the barn and the chicken house, going 
not too close to the house, but cutting the distance home by half. The, the cat would be there be there somewhere, but by daylight and by staying in the open away from the shrubs, she could probably spot him before he saw her, the cat. He was called Dragon. Farmer Fitzgibbon's wife had given him the name as a joke when he was a small kitten pretending to be fierce. But when he grew up, the name turned out to be an apt one. He was enormous, with a huge, broad head and a large mouth with full, curving fangs, needle sharp. He had seven claws on each foot and a thick, furry tail which lashed angrily from side to side. In color, he was orange and white, with glaring yellow eyes, and when he leapt to kill, he gave a high, strangled scream that froze his victims where they stood. But Mr. Frisbee preferred not to think about that. Instead, she came out to the woods from Mr. Age's house and reached the farmyard fence. She thought about <coughs> Timothy. She thought of how his eyes shone with merriment when he made up small jokes, which he did frequently, and how invariably kind he was to his small, scatterbrained sister, Cynthia. The other children sometimes laughed at her when she made mistakes, or grew impatient with her because she was forever losing things, but Timothy never did. Instead, he would help her find them, and when Cynthia herself had been sick in bed with a cold, he had sat by her side for hours and entertained her with stories. He made these up out of his head, and he seemed to have a bottomless supply of them. Taking a firm grip on her packets of medicine, Mrs. Frisbee went under the fence and set out toward the farmyard. The first stretch was a long pasture. The barn itself, square and red and big, rose in the distance to her right. To her left, farther off, were the chicken houses. When at length she, she came abreast of the barn, she saw the cattle wire fence that marked the other end of the pasture. And as she approached it, she was startled by a sudden outburst of noise. She thought at first it was a hen strayed from the chicken yard, caught by a fox. She looked down the fence and saw that it was no hen at all, but a young crow flapping in the grass, acting most odd. As she watched, he fluttered to the top wire of the fence, where he perched nervously for a moment. Then he spread his wings, flapped hard, and took off. But after flying four feet, he stopped with a snap and crashed to the ground again, shedding a flurry of black feathers and squawking loudly. He was tied to the fence, a piece of something silvery. It looked like wire was tangled around one of his legs. The other end of it was caught in the fence. Mrs. Frisbee walked closer, and then she could see it was not wire after all, but a length of silver-colored string, probably left over from a Christmas package. The crow was sitting on the fence, pecking ineffectively at the string with his bill, calling softly to himself a miserable sound. After a moment, he spread his wings, and she could see he was going to try to fly again. Wait, said Mrs. Frisbee. The crow looked down and saw her in the grass. Why should I wait? Can't you see I'm caught? I've got to get loose. But if you make so much noise again, the cat is sure to hear, if he hasn't heard already. You'd make noise, too, if you were tied to a fence with a piece of string and with night coming on. I would not, said Mrs. Frisbee, if I had any sense and knew there was a cat nearby. Who tied you? She was trying to, to calm the crow, who was obviously terrified. He looked embarrassed and stared at his feet. I picked up the string. It got tangled with my foot. I sat on the fence to try to get it off, and it caught on the fence. Why did you pick up the string? The crow, who was very young indeed, in fact, only a year old, said wearily, because it was shiny. You knew better. I had been told, bird brain, thought Mrs. Frisbee, and then recalled what her husband used to say. The size of a brain is no measure of its capacity, and while she might recall it, for the crow's head was double the size of her own. Sit quietly, she said. Look toward the house and see if you can see the cat. I don't see him, but I can't see behind the bushes. Oh, if I could just fly higher. Don't, said Mrs. Frisbee. She looked at the sun. It was sitting behind the trees. She thought of Timothy and of medicine she was carrying, yet she knew she could not leave the foolish crow there to be killed. <clears throat> and killed he surely would be before sunrise, just for want of a few minutes' work. She might still make it by dusk if she hurried. Come down here, she said. I'll get the string off. How? said the crow dubiously. Don't argue. I have only a few minutes, she said this in a voice so authoritative that the crow fluttered down immediately. But if the cat comes, he said, if the cat comes, he'll knock you off the fence with one jump and catch you with the next. Be still. She was already at work with her sharp teeth gnawing at the string. It was twined and twisted and twined again around his right ankle, and she saw she would have to cut through it three times to get it off. As she finished the second strand, the crow, who was staring toward, toward the house, suddenly cried out, I see the cat. Quiet, whispered Mrs. Frisbee. Does he see us? I don't know. Yes, he's looking at me. I don't think he can see you. Stand perfectly still. Don't get in a panic. She did not look up, but stared on the, started on the third strand. He's moving this way. Fast or slow? Medium. I think he's trying to figure out what I'm doing. 
She cut through the last strand, gave it a tug, and the string fell off. There, you're free. Fly off and be quick. But what about you? Maybe he hasn't seen me. But he will. He's coming closer. Mrs. Frisbee looked around. There was not a bit of cover anywhere near. Not a rock, nor a hole, nor a log. Nothing at all closer than the chicken yard, and that was in the direction the cat was coming from, and a long way off. Look, said the crow, climb on my back, quick, and hang on. Mrs. Frisbee did what she was told, first grasping the precious packages of medicine tightly between her teeth. Are you on? Yes. She gripped the feathers on his back, felt the beats of his powerful black wings, felt a dizzying upward surge, and shut her eyes tight. Just in time, said the crow. She heard the angry scream of the cat as he leapt at where they had just been. It's lucky you're so light. I can scarcely tell you're there. Lucky indeed, thought Mrs. Frisbee. If it had not been for your foolishness, I'd never have gotten into such a scrape. However, she thought it was wise not to say so under the circumstances. Where do you live? asked the crow. In the garden patch, near the big stone. I'll drop you off there. He banked alarmingly, and for a moment Mrs. Frisbee thought he meant it literally. But a few seconds later, so fast does the crow fly, they were gliding to earth a yard from her front door. Thank you very much, said Mrs. Frisbee, hopping to the ground. It's I who should be thanking you, said the crow. You saved my life, and you mine. Ah, but that's not quite even. Yours wouldn't have been risked if it had not been for me, me and my piece of string. And since this was just what she had been thinking, Mrs. Frisbee did not argue. We all help one another against the cat, she said. True, just the same. I am in debt to you. If the time ever comes when I can help you, I hope you'll ask me. My name is Jeremy. Mention it to any crow you see in these woods, and he will find me. Thank you, said Mrs. Frisbee. I will remember. Jeremy flew away to the woods, and she entered her house, taking the three doses of medicine with her.